From the remote islands of the sea to the most populous places on earth, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints worship in far-off places. Some gather in tiny branches, others in established stakes, but this spreading of the gospel is a prophecy come true. In 1831, Christ revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith that this gospel shall be preached unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Since the early days, missionary work has been an integral part of the church. Membership around the world has grown steadily. Nearly 16 million people are now members. New buildings are being completed virtually every day. Today, we take you to visit members in many lands. We begin our journey in Brazil, where church membership has grown at an impressive rate. The first stake was organized in 1966. Ten years later, the country had 10 stakes. Today, there are 1.3 million members living in Brazil. With 34 missions, thousands have served here. Last conference, Elder Dallin H. Oaks praised one member's missionary efforts. Our efforts to share the gospel should not be limited to our circle of friends and associates. During the Olympics, we learned of an LDS taxi driver in Rio de Janeiro who carried copies of the Book of Mormon in seven different languages and gave one to whoever would receive them. He called himself the cab driving missionary. He said, the streets of Rio de Janeiro are my mission field. While in Brazil, I caught up with the taxi driver, Manuel Bezerra. This is the car. There are worse jobs in the world. This is a privilege. Manuel Bezerra considers himself lucky. You're never in the same place. Uh, you're always talking to people. Driving may be his job, but it's the talking to people where he says he's truly found his calling. Usually people talk when they are on the on a cab. You know, they, they open up the, their lives and the cab driver also you know, talks to them. Manuel so. calls himself the cab driving missionary. I have Chinese, Japanese, French, Italian, uh, German, English, Portuguese, of course. If you take a ride in his cab. I think this is it. I think this is good enough. Eight languages, eight. Uh, all right there. They are all there. Sure, you'll get to your destination, but you'll also get one of these. And his favorite destination is right here. Sacred ground. This is sacred ground. This is the site of the Rio de Janeiro temple. When it's completed, it'll be the eighth temple in Brazil. Yeah, we are Latter-day Saints. This you have to know. We are LDS people. Right now, Manuel has to drive six hours to get to the closest temple in Campinas. I was really excited when he said Rio de Janeiro. I did like this. Manuel never served a traditional mission. His conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was born on a rocky road. I knelt down and I prayed. That day I prayed. I said vocally, I said, listen, can't you see that I need help? I need help. You have got to help me because my family is falling apart. Falling apart. And uh, one week after that, the two sister missionaries knocked on my door. And five minutes talking to those sisters, I knew. I knew. Uh, he knew. It was 1991 I was baptized, July 7. Now, these streets and these grounds are his mission field. You don't have to ride in his cab to hear his message. So he got interested, and uh, guess what? He's carrying a book of Mormon. We call the Book of Mormon. Yeah, Manuel considers himself lucky. If you love what you do, you don't have to work one day in your life, right? So that's the secret. And it's a secret he's hoping to share with anyone who will listen. I mean, life is wonderful. Up next, we visit the beautiful country of Austria, where ward members band together like family. And India, where traditions are strong and members are few. Austria is a place known for its storybook beauty. 
Opulent architecture and art are the norm, and palaces and lush gardens sprinkle the landscape. More than 8.5 million people call this country home. Of these, 4,641 are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Orson Pratt and William Ritter were the first missionaries to enter the country in 1865. 116 years later, in 1980, the first stake was created in Vienna. Currently, there are two stakes with 14 wards and three branches in the country. Chaba and Liz Yetvich Somle attend a ward in the Vienna stake and say because Mormons are a small minority in the country, most church members know each other well and treat one another like family. It is very familiar. It's very much what I think heaven would look like, sort of a just a big family greeting each other. The wards are full of diversity. Many cultures and languages have found a home in the gospel. Chaba is a first-generation convert and the only member from his family. He was introduced to the gospel as a very young boy while living in Hungary when two missionaries knocked at their door. I saw two huge missionaries covering the whole doorstep and they were just shining. His father wasn't interested in talking with the missionaries, but they left a pamphlet and Book of Mormon with the family. My father put that on the shelf of the hall and I was just very interested in what these guys had to say. Years later, Chaba would meet another Mormon, his violin teacher. As soon as I came to know that he was a Mormon, I just inquired about everything, and I just had questions and questions upon questions. His violin teacher introduced him to the missionaries. As soon as I met the missionaries, I was very glad and, and, a, and a, a feeling of peace uh, carried the discussions. But his family didn't share his enthusiasm. I was scared because of my parents. One of the missionary, he told me, you know what, Chaba, I have a feeling you should go home to your, to your room, to your dorm, and just, you know, uh, uh, pray and ask God what to do. So he did. I knelt down, I prayed again for an answer, and I opened up the Book of Mormon, and uh, in, in the Book of Mosiah, when Alma prays to God for an answer, what to do with the people that are persecuting the church members, that verse just spoke to my heart. He was baptized on April 22, 2001, and later served a mission to Birmingham, England. After my mission, my family life and my personal life improved in an exponential way. Currently, he and his wife Liz are in Provo, teaching classes at Brigham Young University. and busy. India is one of the most populous countries in the world. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints can be found here, but their numbers are few. 80% of the 1.2 billion people who live in India are Hindu, so the roughly 12,700 Latter-day Saints are definitely a minority. However, as the church continues to grow, Recent converts are finding support among other members and missionaries. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland reflects on the missionary efforts there. We work at saving souls one individual at a time. One baptism here and one family there and somebody off to the temple uh, ere long. Uh, that's the way the church grows and that's what's happening in India. Unofficially, proselyting work began in India in 1850 when British sailors visited Calcutta. Then, in 1852, nine missionaries were sent there and several small branches were established. Other missionary efforts followed, but it would be 1993 before the Bangalore mission would officially open. Then in 2006, a second mission opened in New Delhi and the church continues to grow. Five years ago, Elder Oaks traveled to India. The purpose of my presence in India was to create the first stake in Hyderabad in southern India. When President Perkins, the area president, presented the proposition that the district become a stake, you could feel a, a wave of enthusiasm and the hands shot up to approve the proposition. It was uh, 
an experience I'll always remember. Colonel Amaraj remembers when the stake was first created. He is a pioneer in this part of the world. His story of conversion began in 2008. My son one day said that, let's go and see this church. So we just came here, just said hello to some uh, brothers here, and then the missionaries again came to teach us. After taking the missionary lessons, he and his family joined the church in 2009. There is a lot of uh, changes in my life when I uh, think about coming to this church. I came to know that the Heavenly Father loves me and how much Jesus Christ loves me too. He took his family to the temple and his son went on a mission. We in India are all pioneers. Currently, he serves as the branch president in Coimbatore. Up next, we visit Mexico, home to the largest body of saints outside the United States. All right. <laughs> and Jamaica, where the church's humanitarian efforts are changing lives. <laughs> Mexico is home to the largest body of Mormons outside the United States. The church has early roots here, with the first stake being created in 1895. Today, there are 230 stakes with 1.3 million members. Under the direction of local priesthood leadership, the church's self-reliant services program thrives in this area with thousands of members taking advantage of this initiative. We have been teaching about faith in Jesus Christ for, for many years. But when self-reliance initiative came, we can see a, a synergy. Along with gospel principles, the Self-Reliance Program teaches valuable business and life skills to members. They are very excited uh, about the idea to provide to their children. Brigham Torres has been a member of the church his whole life. He heard about the Self-Reliance Services Initiative from his ward leaders. It really helps me, then my family. And now we're trying to help some others. The classes inspired him to plant a garden and to begin raising rabbits and chickens to sell. I saw my kids that they learned the importance to, uh, to share their time. His goal is to help his children earn enough money to pay for their own missions. They can see how we grow as a family as members of the church. The beautiful Caribbean island of Jamaica is home to 2.8 million people, of which 6,000 are members of the LDS faith. The first missionary came here in 1841, but he had little success and his stay was brief. It would take until 1970 before the Mandeville branch would be created. Today, there are 19 wards or branches sprinkled throughout the island. The church humanitarian effort has a rich history here. From the main hospital in Kingston to the small town of Savannah Lamar, LDS Charities has partnered with various nonprofit organizations. I am happy that the LDS Charities has um, responded to our call to come and partner with us. Thousands have benefited from this work. By partnering with other aid organizations like the Salvation Army, the Wheelchair Initiative has given hope to those who need it most. The church provides the wheelchairs and humanitarian missionaries provide the training to help this program succeed. You just come away with such a feeling of appreciation, gratitude, thankfulness that we are involved in such a worthwhile endeavor and a worthwhile effort. There are persons who really and truly could never, 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 never afford a wheelchair. Church members in Jamaica also serve in their communities. In my time when I was really society president, we adopted this school. I have 10 little toes. I have 10 little toes. My daughter actually attends a school. The school has many needs, so the ward applied to the church's humanitarian department for a grant to help pay for the projects. I am very, very grateful for this opportunity. Those funds represent um, the sacrifices 
of others who are willing to put a cause that's worthy above themselves. Um, and that's what Zion is at the end of the day. After getting funding, the missionaries and ward members came together to make the needed improvements. To me, it's important to have these activities in the community to show the community that as a church, we're here doing the Lord's work. Like in many places, the church here is often misunderstood in the community. In Jamaica, there's a stigma that the church is a cult. Some of the people um, look at us like it's a white man church, white people church. But service projects like these help dispel these misconceptions. People will come to know us, um, not like how the world will see us and are afraid of us, but they will see that we are genuine, loving people. When the church comes and participates in events like these, members in our community can look and say, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is really an organization that focuses on people, that loves people, and that is really trying to emulate the Savior at the end of the day. Up next... I was the only uh, priesthood holder in the whole country at, at, at the time. A pioneer member in a place 18 million people call home. This is Mali, West Africa, a country bustling with more than 18 million people. There are no missionaries here and very few people are members of the LDS faith. The handful of members who do live here are mostly from other parts of the world. But not Ye Sama K. He was born in Mali and is a pioneer in his country. He stands as one of the few members who are from this area. I was the only uh, priesthood holder in the whole country at, at, at the time. He is a very busy man, currently serving as the ambassador to India and nine other countries. His conversion to the gospel began when he was gifted a stack of books from a Peace Corps volunteer who was leaving the country. Among these books, a copy of the Book of Mormon. I think someone passed it on to her as well because it was made out to someone else. And with that gift, his journey of conversion began. When I met members of the church in Mali for the first time, um, uh, I already had a Book of Mormon that I received accidentally. While traveling with them, he noticed the family from New York would pray often. I could distinctly understand what they're saying, addressing to Heavenly Father and asking for safety, and I was very impressed with that. Later, he would meet another LDS family from Colorado. They invited him to come to the United States to attend school. My eyes went wide open because education is something that we value. Once in the U.S., he traveled from Colorado to Utah to visit Brigham Young University. I immediately had, like, similar to a flashback, I said, this is my idea of heaven, where we'll be all dedicated to, to serving Father and are busy with religious uh, endeavors. And I asked if I could join the church. After taking the missionary lessons, getting approval to be baptized took time because you're Muslim, returning to a Muslim country, uh, your life could be at risk. And I said, are you kidding me? No, no, my life will not be at risk. My family loved me. Eventually, his desire to join the church was realized. I was baptized in New York on September 14th of 2000, of 2000. And I flew home September 15th of 2000. When he returned to Mali, he was on his own. Going back was very difficult because there was no infrastructure, there was no support uh, whatsoever for, from the church. Despite the challenges, his testimony continued to grow. The knowledge that through baptism that my sins can be forgiven through Jesus Christ was uh, something new to me and it transformed me. Good morning. Today he stands as a witness of Christ in both his work and his home. I find hope in my faith. Um, I don't know how I lived 30 years of my life without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In some African countries, church membership has grown steadily. When the church was first introduced in Ghana in 1978, would-be Latter-day Saints lined up by the hundreds to be baptized, and branches were organized quickly. Currently, there are more than 67,000 members living there. But things are not always easy in this part of the world. 
political unrest can sometimes be a challenge. Members will never forget the government freeze on their meetings. On June 14, 1989, the government of Ghana banned LDS church meetings and sent police to lockdown meeting houses. For the next 18 months, church members were left to keep the Sabbath without being able to go to church. The freeze actually taught me to know and to understand how important the Sabbath is to God's children and to his church. At times, we take things for granted. When we were meeting every Sabbath, we were taking things for granted. But when the freeze came, we couldn't meet as brothers and sisters. We didn't know what to do until we had a message from the brethren that we can organize our sacrament meetings in our various homes. And in a way, that also sanctified our homes. As we sat and sang, and bless the bread and water. The Spirit of the Lord was strong. Our home teacher came to us and told us that on every Sunday, he will come and pick us up from his home to his home so we can organize our sacrament meeting there. If this brother could see the importance of the Sabbath and spend all his time only to ensure that the Sabbath is observed, then I need to follow He's a good example. I want to keep the Sabbath holy. The Lord says that is what really shows the relationship that we have with him. If we don't respect his day, I don't know how to give my respect to him. After 18 months, the government lifted the freeze. Currently, membership is strong and continues to grow. Thank you for joining us today as we visited members in many lands.